So I, I was sitting out where I normally sit years ago, back when I graduated from BBC in 2012, and it ha- I couldn't help but think of the years I spent here holding my wife's hand while we were out there and sitting through chapel sessions. And it, it got me thinking of the first time my wife and I met, so I thought I'd just open up sharing that story. So this was way, way back in years of old when Professor Cornette was the Greek professor here. And uh, we were in first year Greek, and my wife was a transfer student, and I'd already been here two years. And I saw her the first day of class, and I thought, Wow, she is beautiful. But I decided, and guys, there's something to be learned from this. I decided I'm going to wait a week or two, and I'm just going to see if she's crazy or not. And it'll save me taking her out on a date. And then, you know, I won't have to go through the emotional turmoil. We'll just find out. And maybe it'll, if she is crazy, maybe it'll peek through the cracks, and I'll get a better idea. And I won't have to bother uh, with it. So I, the second day of class, I was waiting outside of class, and the door was locked, and we were waiting for uh, Professor Cornett to come and unlock it for us. And uh, I was sitting there with one of the other guys in class, and he said to me, do you see that Annabelle girl? The one who sat up in the, in the front, on the right? And I actually honestly didn't know her name yet. But he said, yeah. I said, yeah, I think I noticed her. And at that moment, I knew he was going to go try to ask her out after class. And so fortune favors the bold. Class ended that day. I cut that guy off. I walked right up to her. <laughs> I asked her out. Nine months later, we were married. And so... Uh, one of the best decisions of my life. And uh, anyway, so it's, uh, it's fun. I hope you guys have your own little BBC stories while you're here. And I hope you leverage the opportunity God's given you to learn under some great people here and to really be invested in and raised up for ministry. So um, I'm going to tell you guys just sort of in three phases. I was asked to paint a picture of what a healthy rural ministry likes. I'm glad they think my, our ministry is healthy. Um, but and I'm, I'm not a very good painter, so there's going to be lots of pictures. Hopefully you can deal with that. Um, but we'll, we'll flip through some of that. And just to give you a, a sense in advance of where we're going today, uh, it's not a traditional sermon, but I'm going to walk you guys just through kind of the city of Myrtle Point because you need to have a good sense of where you're ministering, wherever God sends you. Um, I'm going to talk about the church, Myrtle Point First Christian Church. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about my wife and I's life there along with our family. Um, not because I'm narcissistic and just want to share that stuff, but because it hopefully will paint a good picture for the kind of life that you might have if you chose to go and to minister in a rural context like this. And then finally, at the very end of it, I'm just going to briefly share a couple of just practical pieces of advice that I hope will be a blessing to you. I think they're, they're functional advice in any setting, but they're particularly applicable in a rural ministry. Um, and so I hope this will be a blessing to you, and, and with any luck, they won't cut me off before I'm done. We'll see here. Um, So first of all, this is just a picture of sort of the mountain valley that Myrtle Point sits in. We can jump to the next slide. And uh, if you see here on these maps, on the very right-hand side on that edge is Boise, Idaho, uh, just about in line with where Myrtle Point is. And Myrtle Point is way, way off there to the left. So here's a zoom-in image. You got the I-5 corridor in Roseburg off on the right-hand side now, and Myrtle Point about 15 minutes uh, from the Oregon coast. So we're we're in a little protected cove, um, but... Uh, we're about 15 minutes from, from the ocean itself, though about a half hour to 40 minutes from some good beaches. Um, this is just a, a zoom-in image of Myrtle Point itself. It's a smaller town, traditionally a logging community, um, though economically depressed as logging became uh, largely legislated out of existence uh, over the last few decades. So um, anyway, this is our tiny little town, and let's talk about just some of the demographics And again, folks, if you're going anywhere to minister, let's jump to the next slide. If you're going anywhere to minister, I'd highly encourage you to look into some of this data. I forgot about this. So this is just an image outside of town. This is kind of what the train looks like. If you were headed into Myrtle Point, uh, driving on the highway there, this is a a mile or so outside of town, and this is what the the roadway would look like. Um, Oh, and this is a view from a local hillside, our logging museum, one of our few little tourist traps, and it it doesn't trap many. Um, (laughs) Here's our main street. There's still a little bit of life there, but a lot of closed down storefronts too, um, but a cute little town. So um, anyway, back to some of these demographics. Let's, let's just talk about some of the data because I'm a nerd and I like that. Um, and, and again, I want to encourage you, if you go into ministry anywhere, you really should be studying this stuff before you get there. You need to know who you're ministering to and where they're at and how they're living their life. And you won't know that fully from the 2010 census record, for example, but you could get a pretty accurate picture. You can get a sense of it. So Myrtle Point, for the last decade or so, has sat pretty stable at around 2,500 for their population. Um, Median age in Myrtle Point is about 51 years old. So you'll notice that that's, that's about 20 years different than Oregon on average. That tells us that we have a lot more seniors. If you wanted to go to Myrtle Point and start a church that only had young people in it, you'd probably have a hard time. 
Um, and there are young people in the community, don't get me wrong, but uh, because of the job market, so many people, as is the case across America and many small towns, many of the, the folks in your demographic have to leave the town to go find work in their chosen field. It's uh, one of the things that drives them. And so, unfortunately, that demographic is largely, is largely missing, so our, you know, our evangelistic efforts have to focus on on both. Um, in terms of income, you can see we're fairly economically depressed. Um, the average in Oregon, it was 12 years, not 20. I'm sorry, I just caught that. Um, and then it's about $20,000 difference though in median income. So uh, again, with the lo- death of logging industries, the average income in towns like this is a lot lower. That doesn't mean that you actually get people who are a lot more resourceful uh, with it, which is a, a sort of a cultural value of many of these small towns. You, you make a lot out of a little. Um, So looking at median house values, it's about $150,000. You compare that to the state average. So this is about half of what the state average house sells for. All right, next slide. Let's just talk about some practical day-to-day stuff. If you wanted to go to Walmart and you lived in Myrtle Point, Oregon, you'd have to travel 45 minutes. It's 45 minutes to the nearest Walmart. The nearest Costco is an hour and a half. The nearest Target, oh, I'm sorry, girls. It's it's two and a half hours. I know my wife had to mourn that fact. Um, And to the beach, 35 minutes. So let me point out, I don't, have a, I don't have a slide with the positive side of this, but when you're in a rural community, one of the big benefits, though, is that you do have God's playground right in your backyard. So you have great hunting. We've got some of the biggest dunes in the country out where you can go play around with ATVs, great hiking trails, and you can go walk the beach any weekend you want to. So there's a lot of these perks, but... Um, but there's some things that might be missing. So Myrtle Point. Now, when we ministered in Grangeville, Idaho, I'll mention that Grangeville had the only traffic light in the county, in the whole county. People had to travel an hour just to circle the block for driver's ed and get experience with a traffic light. And so we are in a thriving metropolis. Now we've upgraded from uh, one traffic light to two. Now this isn't in the county. It's just in Myrtle Point proper. Um, So we've only got two traffic lights. And a weird side effect of this is when you travel back to a place like Boise, you are suddenly shocked by the traffic. Because to us, three cars at the intersection, that's heavy traffic, you know? You kind of are like, what's going on here? Um, if you want to get fast food, I hope you like A&W, because um, that's your choice. Uh, I don't think it's bad. Um, and then, you know, for the town itself, just to give you some brief description, there's seven churches in town. Only two of those churches actually have full-time staff. Many of them have no staff at all and are just barely, uh, barely surviving. They're a few steps from the doors closing, um, others have, you know, perhaps a pastor who retired 15 years before, who's just sort of filling in, and that's not an uncommon thing uh, in a small town context like this. Okay, our next slide. Here's a picture of the church itself. We're going to start talking about Myrtle Point Christian Church proper. Again, just I'm trying to give you imagery of this to see what this could look like, to have a sense of what it might be. Um, and so, here's inside the church, and your very own Pat Larson over here, who graduated last year. Yeah. So you, you'll probably see some familiar faces as we go through that. Pat is our new worship and associate pastor, and we are very blessed that he and Nicole are there. Um, so there he is on a random Sunday morning um, helping to lead our team in worship. Here's our, our welcome room where we welcome as many guests as we can. We have uh, fresh-baked pastries every Sunday morning. They even have a custom-roasted coffee that we serve uh, in order to try to draw people in and show them the best hospitality that we possibly can. Um, but this just sort of gives you a sense of what it might be to walk around on a Sunday morning. This is prior to first service, I'll mention too. <coughs> so we actually have a lower, uh, a smaller size crowd here than there would be between our two services. Um, here's just a few baptisms from the last couple months. Um, and just, it's cool to see God's changing lives, God's reaching people who don't know him yet. And uh, actually, in the, in the upper left-hand corner there, you can see Nate and Allison Harris, who are our, our youth directors, and uh, they baptized one of our teens here a few weeks ago, and um, it's just cool to see God at work doing that and, and how he can chase the face, change the face of our community one person at a time uh, through what he does. All right, a um, little bit more information about the church. We have two services. Our average attendance for 2018 was 111. Year to date so far, we're about 125. Now, this last piece of data is pretty notable. And many of you, if you go into church in a big city or a small town, really should be aware that 74% of churches in America are dying or in decline. Let's think in for a second. Three out of four churches that you might go to, this is the latest data suggests, 
are in decline. Now, when we started at Myrtle Point here three years ago, um, that was largely the case. Our, our demographics tilted really strong towards, um, we'll say, the outgoing generation. And, um, and it's been interesting to see how much God has just been at work and how much he's blessed us in that time. I remember Annabelle and I were candidating and we visited the church and we did the guest preaching and we got out to our car afterwards and took a deep breath. And uh, there was, just as we left, we briefly shook hands with one young couple in the church and we got out to the car and they were walking out to their car. And again, this is the one young married couple that regularly attended the church. Annabelle looked at me and said, well, I hope we like them because they're the only ones we got in terms of another young couple. And, um, and you know, interestingly, they've, they've grown into leadership there, and, and uh, they're now our youth directors that you saw in a previous photo. Um, but God's done some great things. That said, you know, our, our average yearly attrition, and this isn't from people leaving the church to go to another church. This is 90% or more of this year to year as we track it is actually people dying, moving into nursing homes, or moving out of the area. 15 to 20% a year. So you think about that, in three years, that means that about 50 to 60% of our church has left. So what do you have to do to stop a church from dying when that's going on? And again, this would be true in an urban area as well. If you're in a church that's in a death phase, it may be in a slower death phase, whatever, but if it's in a phase like that, you know, you know going into most ministries, you're gonna have to be evangelistic. You're gonna have to have a heart for winning lost people to Jesus because if you don't, there's, there's probably not gonna be a church there in a few years. And God is so much bigger than that problem, but you gotta meet him there and be ready for it and you should know what you're walking into. So I share that for that reason. Let's jump to the next slide. Um, just to give you an idea of some of the ministries at the church, we have a, a worship ministry, children's ministry, youth ministry, small groups. We've got a, a clothing closet. We give free clothing to impoverished people in our, in our community. And we also have a, a once a month meal we serve before we open the closet to where um, those people in the community that are having a hard time with nutrition can come in, eat free of charge, and get clothing at the same time. And we have a lot of regular people there. Our team does really well with this. We even have, uh, we have a closet full of prom dresses and stuff like that to where uh, we can meet a lot of these basic needs that a lot of impoverished families just simply aren't able to come to. So it's a cool, a cool area of service. We've got deacons and deaconesses and uh, we've also, that do a variety of things. Uh, and we also have a, a cool technology ministry um, that's led by Amy Bond, who's also a, a, a former student here. So let's jump to the next slide here. Oh, you know, I do want to mention briefly, I didn't mention missions up there because, but our church does have it as part of its core value. We have a real heart for missions. And I think this is really impressive for the smaller country church. This, our church has given over a million dollars to missions in its lifetime, which um, is pretty cool. So uh, up there, uh, you can see a lot of our, our staff members. And so you, you, again, probably see some familiar faces, Pat and Nicole, who we brought on this summer. Um, our youth director is Nate and Allison. Interestingly, Nate, and I'll m- mention this in a, in a minute, is a local police officer. Um, Allison is a local teacher. And so God's really used those things to actually bring a lot of teens into their ministry. In fact, it is weird. I have had, I have had teens and their families who have started attending our church because Nate is a police officer, cared about them, took time to pour into them, and the families decided we need to go to church and we need to go to his church, which is pretty cool. Um, now they're only doing their, they're only part time with us as youth directors, but they do a great job and they've built the group from about three to 15 now is about what we're averaging. Um, Amy Bond is our tech ministry director. She's rebuilding our website and, um, setting up online giving and doing video intros to the church and stuff like that. So we're, we're exhaustively overhauling a lot of that. Um, and so we're very blessed to have her and there's my, my secretary. Now, let me just say at a church this size, this is not common. If you go step into a church like this, like I did three years ago, I had a secretary, and I was every one of these things otherwise. It's a little bit daunting, right? I had never adjusted a website before, but I had to figure it out. It was time to go read online and and piece it together. So in rural ministry, uh, you're not a specialist. You're the multi-tool. You do whatever it is that you have to, and that's part of how you get there. But, But by God's grace, now we have... We have some people who are, who are taking over and exercising diligence over these areas and frankly, doing better than I could have had it. All right, um, just 
a, a few things I want to talk about, just in terms of what God's done at our church. You've got an image of it now. But when Annabelle and I started in this community, we really prayed that God would give us his heart for the people that we were ministering to, that we would have some sort of love that reflected the love he had for them. And we really wanted to connect with people there. And we had researched in advance, and we knew that the two biggest employers in town were the school district and were the city of Myrtle Point itself. And so we started praying for God to open doors and to see what we could do. And with the school district, I, I, met, I met the superintendent. We became friends. Um, God has since then gotten it to where now we actually have quarterly meetings with all of our administrators in the district. They come together, all the principals, the, uh, the, the superintendent herself. We do a lunch for them every three months or so. We find out what's going on with them. If there's any way we can support them, we pray with them. And so we have this cool connection point. We're a part of, part of their team in a sense. And it's been neat to see how God's used that here. During graduation ceremony last year, um, the tech person got sick and they had nobody to help him out. And so uh, to help them run projection while they were doing the graduation ceremony. And so the first person they called, it was Amy Bond. They called Amy. And so Amy, had, she had built that relationship. She had that friendship with them. And so she was able to step in. And again, that increased our rapport. And uh, this year we had... Uh, with, there were issues at the high school and they weren't able to do the one week long staff in service at the, at the school. And so they called us and we got to host it. And it was a huge blessing. We rolled out our best hospitality, had all the, all the staff from the high school meeting at our church, doing their in service and we got to love on them. Now, let me ask this. If one of those staff members decides to make a step towards Christianity, if they want to find a church home to come to, what are odds we're going to be higher on the list? So it's a lot better because of that. Um, in fact, we were even invited this year. Uh, we wanted to do something special as a gift for all the district members. And so during the district-wide in-service this year, the, our superintendent invited us in, and we handed out $5 coffee cards to every teacher just to say thank you for them serving in the community. And we also got to uh, promote Financial Peace University, which we teach at least on a yearly basis, uh, to help people get past some of the binds of poverty that, that this smaller community has. Um, so it's been cool to see God at work in that. And to see him bearing fruit, we have more teachers at our church now than we did before because of it. Um, we also have a, an active ministry with the police department. When I got there, I, I made friends with Nate right off the bat. And he was a local police officer. And so he encouraged me to go be a reserve officer. And, and so I went in and started doing that. And uh, last year, we had kind of a, a turning point with that. I was already serving, but we were praying as a leadership about what we could do to bless our community around Christmas time. We wanted to do something that would make a difference to the people of Myrtle Point. And so as we prayed about it, we realized that our officers in town, they patrol one at a time. So you got one guy on shift, there's no convenient backup nearby, and none of them had body cameras. And so we, we thought that was disappointing. Um, and as we prayed about it, we felt led. We actually did a fundraiser over Christmas, and we raised $13,000 to where every officer in our department could have a, a good, high-quality body camera that they could wear. Um, and so it helps protect them, it helps protect the community, and it's interesting how God worked through that, because we have, you know, we have more officers in there now, uh, our police chief and his wife are now part of the church family, um, and uh, not only am I, am I a reserve officer with them, but I'm also their chaplain for the department, and again, God has just opened these doors, he's given us opportunities, and I don't think that everybody I interact with is going to come to the church, but I'm trying to build relationship, I'm trying to give an invitation and an opportunity and so these have been cool areas where God's born fruit, just to highlight a few. All right, uh, next slide. In terms of life in a rural community, we don't have a good family photo uh, since our twin girls were born, but, but you guys can see in the picture there, there's my wife and I, our oldest daughter, Hazel, our, our oldest son, Marlo, Hudson, and then the two girls who are now two months old, Viola and Eleanor, our twin girls. So we got five under five. It's a noisy household, um, but it's a lot of fun. Um, and so I just want to show you a little glimpse into our life because, you know, again, Target's not nearby, but there are a lot of really cool things that are uh, when you're in a smaller community like this. So let's jump to the next slide. And, uh, you know, I just got a few photo collages of things here. Uh, we've, got, we've got chickens in our backyard, and my kids love to go out and play with the chickens. Uh, we've got rabbits that we breed um, for meat, sorry. And, um, and uh, our kids get to go play with those, and, and uh, we hunt in order to actually provide food as well. But a lot of these things might not be as acceptable in a bigger city, uh, might be zoned out of existence, but here in a small town, you can have these things and they're great, 
great blessings to me as a father because my kids are learning responsibility through this. They're learning how to interact with these animals and exercise diligence. Um, here's you know, our backyard here. Kids are playing there all the time. We've got a river that flows right through town, the Coquille River, so my kids love to go down there and play in that. Uh, above is a picture of a squad car when, you're, when you've got these strong friendships and even brotherhood that just exists among you and, and others like this. It's, it's really common to have squad cars parked in my driveway and to have guys coming in for their coffee break and just to come hang out with my wife and my family and I. Um, and my, my kids, my two oldest kids are already telling me, Dad, I'm not old enough to be an officer yet. But, <laughs> but they're thinking about it. They, they love the interactions they have. You can see my son Marlo in his little police jacket crawling around in one of those, the cruisers there uh, enjoying, enjoying that liberty. Um, so... Before I dive into these last three advice points, I just want to, from a practical standpoint, point out some things. You know, I know a lot of you guys, 80% of America comes from an urban area. That's what the latest data suggests. So a lot of you guys might have come from that kind of environment. Rural ministry is something incredibly special. You don't move just into a community, you move into a family. And if you'll take the time to get to know people and really invest in them, not only can God change you through it, but he can actually change the face of the community. You can have a profound impact on what's happening. You, you're never going to be a mega church pastor in Myrtle Point. That's not a thing. And if that's what you want uh, with all the glamour and glitz, then this probably isn't the way to it. But it might be a good question about what God wants, right? And I think there is an incredible need. This is some of the most impoverished, spiritually need people. The state of Oregon is one of the least church states in the union. I mean, we are in huge support of sending missionaries to foreign countries. But most people around us don't know Jesus. And we could start right here. And in a community like this, if you come in and love people and love Jesus, you can make a profound impact and really affect things. So um, just some, some practical advice as we talk about serving, especially in rural ministry. But again, um, these things carry over in general. If, if I were you guys in your position today, I'd be looking for opportunities to serve. Now, not just in a, rural con, in, in a rural context. I'd look into a variety of contexts and ways to get experience in a variety of places. But it would be great for you to see for yourself what it's like to live in a place like this, even if it's only for a few months in the summer, and get some sense. Because you might find God's calling you to something like that. Um, so I'd recommend that. Our second point here, and this is a big one, I, I want to encourage you guys to remember that small towns have big memories. This is either a really big strength or, or a really big detriment, depending on how you play things out. In a small town, I'll say right off the bat, if you do something wrong, if you lie to somebody, if you misrepresent something you're selling, whatever it might be, maybe you cut somebody off in traffic, maybe you just give somebody the cold shoulder, there's a good chance they're related to 25% of the population. <laughs> and what you did will not be soon forgotten. In a big city, to be honest, you could, be, you could probably be giving people the burden traffic and no one at your church would ever know. You do that in Myrtle Point and it'll be known the next day one way or the other. Everybody will know. And your, your ministry, your capacity to speak truth to people, it'll be destroyed. I mean, literally, you can destroy it in a heartbeat if you're not careful. People remember things and they remember things from decades ago. On the flip side of that, it's a superpower if you do it right. If you love people well and, and show your love for Jesus through that, then you can actually have a generational change on that. Now, this is a, a small example. And this picture is my father, uh, Marlo Pounds, who my son's named after. And here he is on a flight deck with Nicole Larson, Pat's wife's grandfather, Ken Dickey. They fought in Vietnam together. My dad was in John McCain's sister squadron uh, flying off the USS Hancock had 180 combat missions over North Vietnam. And when he'd come back, Ken Dickey was one of the men who'd be waiting there to patch him up if something was wrong. So these men went and fought in war together. And when I started in Myrtle Point, Ken was one of the leaders at the church. Now, I didn't know Ken. I hadn't spent time around him. But the brotherhood that he had with my father and the impact that my father had had on the community when he graduated from high school there um, and, and had been involved they all bore positive fruit in my ministry. Two or three generations later, a good thing done before bore good fruit. And you have within your power, if you do things right, if you're diligent and, and cautious and shrewd in what you do, 
You have the ability to have an impact in a community like this that will range out for generations. You might be known as the person who walked with that family through grandpa dying, who was there a lot more than they had to be, but who earnestly showed love, and people generations later will remember it because of what you did, and that's, that is a wonderful thing. Um, but it plays both ways, so you've got to be really cautious about how you live because your hypocrisy will be apparent, and it won't take long at all for the small town rumor mill to sweep it up and, and at least tell some version of it. All right, the, uh, the last point, the last uh, recommendation I have for you if you're thinking about going into rural ministry is remember, and this is true again of urban ministry as well, remember that ministry is really based on relationship. At the end of the day, that's what it comes down to. When I, when I was getting ready to leave with my wife and we were preparing to go start our ministry in Grangeville, Idaho, I went and talked to the youth pastor I'd had growing up. And this pastor had been really successful. I had a lot of respect for him. He and his wife had taken a youth group of about 12 kids and turned it into one of about 200. And um, in my life, he was a great Christian role model. And I asked him, as I got ready to leave for Grangeville, what his one piece of advice would be for me as I left. And I was waiting anxiously to hear it. And his one piece of advice was, Lloyd, if you love people, they'll know it. If you don't love people, they'll know that too. At the end of the day, you stepping out and going into these areas and having these relationships, really, you need to be showing Jesus' love in the best way you can. And there's gonna be times where you're stressed out and where you've had long weeks and where things have been hard, kind of like finals week, and yet you've got to push forward anyway. And yet in the midst of that, you have to really have a heart to show sincere love to people, even people who are of no earthly use to you. Which sounds like it would be obviously obvious and easy, but sometimes it's harder than one would think. Um, and so just as an encouragement, when you go into ministry, truly invest in people at every level, make friends with them, show sincere interest in them, and... Uh, and even just in your hospitality. Try to make them feel as welcomed as possible. And if you do that, you can really have a profound impact in where you're at. Sometimes some of these fundamental things are things we skip over, and we'd like to just have some sort of algorithm we could plug in to have a church be successful and grow. And there's some systems that are helpful, but at the end of the day, so often it comes down to fundamentals. A few of these things are pretty fundamental principles, but I want to challenge you guys to really think about them wherever you're going in ministry, especially though if you're going to rural ministry, um, to consider them because these things when lived out are going to bear the most fruit. Um, with that, I think that's our last slide. So with that, thank you for your time. I hope that was uh, edifying in some way for you. And uh, I'll ask you guys to go ahead and just join me for a moment of prayer. Lord, I know that there's a lot of tired people here this week. It's finals week. I remember what that's like and the doses of Red Bull that accompanied it. Lord, I pray that you uh, would be with these students in the week ahead, that you would... Uh, continue to carry them through this week, sharpen their minds, give them wisdom. But more than that, Lord, as each of them look at where you want them to be, pray that you would give them a clear sense of direction. Even if they're just a freshman here, Lord, would you make your calling clear to them and open their eyes to what you want to do in their lives. Pray that you'd give them wisdom and direction. Pray that you'd receive honor and glory through it. Father, we love you and thank you for your blessings. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. As a final note, I'll mention we are always looking for uh, summer interns. If you're, any of you are interested, feel free to contact Pat and I. And, uh, it would be a paid position, but thank you all for your time.